Good morning, everyone. Technical difficulties like crazy. Pray for me. <laughs> I want to throw that computer like, like a Frisbee. Um, let's pray. <laughs> oh God, in mercy, bless us. Let your face beam with joy as you look down at us. Send us around the world with the news of your saving power, your eternal plan for all humankind. How everyone throughout the earth will praise the Lord. How glad the nations will be singing for joy because you are their king and will give true justice to your people. Praise God, O world. May all the peoples of the earth give thanks to you for the earth has yielded abundant harvests. God, even our own God, will bless us and peoples from remotest lands will worship him. Lord, we're here this morning online and and physically gathered, and we just pray, Lord, that you would be the connecting, um, connect us all as Christ's body, and honor our gathering, Lord, online and here as well. We love you. Thank you for this beautiful weather, this beautiful day, and these people here. We love you. We praise you. We lift this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can stand, you can sit, and uh, let's worship together. Lift our hearts.
seated. There's a lot to pray about among us and in our region, in our world, um, those down south experiencing the horrible effects of that hurricane. Um, we need to pray for them and people in our community and our schools are opening up and I know that the staff and parents are concerned with looking at other schools open up across the country and then seeing the virus numbers spike. So we've got a lot to pray about. This is your time, our time to lift our voices and we know God hears every prayer. Lord, hear our prayers. Let's just take some time and be before him. Thank you, Father. Thank you and we praise you for this time together outside here on such a beautiful day, Lord. We feel the wind in our face, and we just uh, are joyful and happy to be able to be here. Um, we do pray for all of those who are not able to come physically, Lord, but I hope that they feel the love and the union of our church body as seamless, and um, we pray for for all of our members, Lord, and uh, we pray that they'll um, continue to worship you and praise you at home and listen to the uh, service online, Lord, stay connected with all of us. Um, and I do especially pray for the schools and for the children and the teachers that are going to be starting up some as early as tomorrow, Lord, and um, uh, I just pray that you'll give the um, the people in charge at these schools the um, wisdom to set things up in the most protective way that they can. Um, I know we all want to try to get back to some normalcy in our lives, Lord, but um, in this unnormalcy, um, we pray that will all come to know you, Lord, that so many will turn to you when it's so obvious that you're our only answer, Lord. And uh, again, I just 
taking the protection of the children uh, in our area here, um, as well as in, in all of the schools, Lord, but um, we're praying for those around us and our family and our grandchildren and protect them, uh, help them to be able to continue on, Lord. Um, and uh, we just know that you love us and know that you only want, you only want good for us, Lord, and help us to remember that and pray to you and know that you do walk beside us day by day. In your precious name we pray.
Father, we thank you that your nature is crying out to you around us, God. We thank you for this continued beautiful weather. We thank you that you're sovereign over all things, Lord. We may not understand how and why certain things happen, Lord, down here. But nevertheless, we trust your hand and your control over it all. We pray for our schools, Lord, um, for protection. We pray a blessing on the plans that are being instituted, whether virtual, live, or some kind of hybrid mix of that, Lord. We pray that the students and the families and the staff, the administrators, would all be protected and safe, Lord. We thank you for our police and firefighters who continue to respond even in the midst of fear. We thank you for our hospitals, Lord. We pray that they would not be overburdened, overcrowded. And we do pray for a vaccine, God, so that we could reclaim some kind of normalcy, particularly in church, Lord. But nevertheless, Lord, we know that um, we know that you're smiling because we're gathering, Lord. We choose to gather in your name. We thank you for our, your spirit, which empowers us and emboldens us, Lord, to take wise but bold steps in your name, Lord. And we thank you for the words that Jesus gave us in the Lord's Prayer. Words that we can pray when we don't have the words, when we're going through difficult times. We thank you for those words and we pray them right now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, it's a blessing to be here with you all this morning. Um, I don't have too many announcements. Um, as I mentioned last week, the St. Pauli's shed is just temporarily closed, so we're just waiting to hear more information on, um, and I know they're backlogged with the virus has upset everything with clothes collecting. So just for now, it's uh, temporarily closed. Um, we have revival prayer coming up September 7th, Monday the 7th, 7 p.m. out here per the guidelines. And then we have all church prayer, September 2nd, Wednesday, September 2nd, 7 p.m. out here as well. And um, yeah, we tried to go live this morning, but it, um, the, uh, the internet said otherwise. So <laughs> we'll just keep trying and um, just keep it in prayer. We know that our virtual friends um, would love to tune in live just to, you know, so we could all worship together. But um, just pray that, that God would be in the connections, um, even though our human eyes may not see him there. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, uh, for those tuning in virtually, uh, we're still working hard. But um, I don't have any other announcements. Um, Betsy. Betsy's has brought some bags of peaches, and uh, those are for, for all of us. And if, um, if they run out, you have more, correct? Yes? So feel free. Um, they're delicious. So any other announcements at this point? Well, good morning, everyone. And again, welcome to those tuning in on live. We're all welcome here 
uh, in Christ. And um, so obviously today, because we haven't gone live, the service will be posted later after this, um, the live gathering today. Last week, we embarked on a new journey um, that I'm very excited about, Grace That Is Greater, our new sermon series. I pray that we discover and relearn together that God's grace means so much more than just forgiveness. God's grace is far greater than anything we could possibly imagine, comprehend, or try to understand. Amen? And God's grace can teach us new and better ways to live. Here's what I think is one of the greatest challenges facing followers of Jesus today. It's a limited view, a limited understanding of God's grace. The grace of God is a reality greater than the human reason and greater than human intellect. But we can grasp it even right now. It's accessible to all of us. And I would argue that it's more vital to us than the air we breathe. The grace of God is available to everyone now. God's grace is ready. It's always been ready to reach across every nation, every culture, and every generation. Many people say God loves me just the way I am, and that's true. He does. But I think maybe some of us have gotten too comfortable with that statement. Aren't we less comfortable with the fact that God loves me so much that he doesn't want me to stay just the way I am? Last week we learned from the Apostle Paul's letter to Titus that as much as God's grace saves and forgives, his grace also teaches. Most of us are okay with the forgiveness part, but maybe perhaps we skip school, as it were, when it comes to learn how to deny those ungodly thoughts and those worldly passions. God's question to each of us is, are you willing to learn how to live sensible and upright lives? Are you willing to keep my commandments, God asks us? Walk in a manner that's pleasing to him. Richard Foster, a man who spent his adult life encouraging Christians to grow in the grace of God, he points out that the message of God's grace is far more than merely a means for gaining forgiveness. Foster says that in most pulpits, there's a disconnect between the good news of Jesus' sacrifice and our calling to not just become, but continue to be the light of the world. So hearing the same message week after week after week, maybe it's numbed some of us. We continue to remain in the same place. And Foster asks, having been saved by grace, have we been paralyzed by grace? You know, if we're cramped and we're hunkered down in the notion that God's grace is just another word for forgiveness, I don't think we'll ever discover his amazing grace available to us for everyday living, you know, for relationships. His grace as we minister to others. His grace to help us through tough times. And even his grace to help us find more joy in the good times. You know, in the New Testament alone, there are connections between grace and truth, grace and power, grace and spiritual gifts, grace and thanksgiving, grace and generosity, grace and provision, grace and suffering, grace and destiny, grace and peace. And the list isn't nearly complete. So if our view of grace is limited to just receiving forgiveness, how can Jesus be our model for how to continue to receive God's grace, to live in grace, to depend upon grace, and to even dance in grace? Who taught Peter, John, and Paul, and countless other believers how to live the kind of grace-filled lives that we see in Acts and the history of the church? How does grace apply to everyday life for us now? These are all good questions. And that's why we're spending time on grace in this series. So come to church, continue to tune in, and we're going to learn together about God's grace. Amen.
to those of, to those of us who have been to church you know for maybe for quite some time grace might seem something simple like wow we christians get a pretty good deal right in various church circles how is grace defined for you for me it was not getting what we deserve or getting what we don't deserve right god's unmerited favor or the acronym god's riches at christ's expense all of these ideas about grace are true, but they're just a small part of the whole truth. These partial truths, fragmented truths, can actually, if we view them fragmentedly, can harm our spiritual formation. I'm just a sinner saved by grace, we might say. There's nothing good inside me, we might say. I'll always be a sinner. I'll always be dirty. That's all I'm capable of. You know, some people have sung the same song 40, 50, 60 years. Our sin diagnosis is chronic, right? Ain't nothing we can do about it except to continually see God's grace in Jesus. So are we paralyzed by what we've been told, what we've been led to believe about grace? Philosopher and theologian Dallas Willard warns us against the idea that the low level of spiritual living among professing Christians is to be regarded as only natural, only what is to be expected. And you get what Willard is saying. He suggests that the notion that our human destiny, you know, even if we're saved, is constant failure on our part, and that Christ's ministry is nothing but unending forgiveness. Many of us have experienced the new birth, and we're convinced that our cosmic state is to forever remain in that cradle. You know, that was me, friends, and I'm still learning how to grow up and mature in God's grace. We've talked too much about, you know, what sin takes away, I think. We've talked too little about what the Spirit has put in us. Dr. Willard is concerned with more than the cure. True, our life with God must start with the cure, but the possibilities of new life in Christ are quite literally endless. You know, I have a friend who ends every prayer with, forgive us for the many ways we've failed you. In your name we pray, amen. You know, and it doesn't matter if he's blessing the food or before a meal or if he's asking for wisdom in an important decision. It's his default closing you know, like a customized signature, you know, a half-hearted scribble on a receipt. You know, I'm not saying that he's not sincere every time he prays it. I'm sure he is, but I wonder if, I wonder if Jesus gets tired of, of hearing it. You know, no relationship on earth could survive if one partner constantly affirmed, I'm no good, I'm not worthy. What kind of relationship requires constant constant rehashing of our inadequacy well i'd like to suggest an answer an old testament relationship so today if you brought your bibles with you or you have an app um, we're looking at hebrews chapter 10 uh, hebrews 10 verses 1 through 3 the book of hebrews discusses the practice of forgiveness before jesus came hebrews 10 Starting in verse 1, we read, The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have, would have been cleansed once and for all, and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. Just kind of want to take a moment and focus on that final phrase. The people of the Old Testament experienced an annual reminder of their sins. You know, my friend reminds himself of his sin every time he prays. The unspoken message is that he was and continues to be powerless against sin. Powerless 
before he came to Jesus. And he is apparently still powerless against sin even after he received Jesus. Dallas Willard calls this the miserable sinner theology. Simply put, if we're told often enough that we're miserable sinners who are unable to overcome our shortcomings in God's eyes, sooner or later, we'll begin to see ourselves in that light, even though we've turned to new life in Christ. For such people, following Jesus does not include the possibility of being formed into something new, different, something better, like Jesus' likeness. Every single one of us has endless possibility and opportunity in God's rich grace to be more and more like Jesus. As I said last week, it's not just a problem with our understanding of grace or lack thereof. I think it's also our understanding of Jesus or lack thereof. His message, his sacrifice, his kingdom, his mission for us. To see the work of Jesus as nothing but an endless thank offering for sin, I think is to try and consign and constrain him to the Old Testament priesthood. You can't do it. His is a greater priesthood, amen, capable of forever altering and changing us at the very core. You know, I'm grateful that he paid the price for my sin, eternally grateful. But once forgiven, we should also be grateful for his resurrection empowerment, which is capable of changing us from the inside out. Hallelujah. Make no mistake, sin is cancer, and it will kill us in this life. It will condemn us in the next you know, it's serious business, so the Father has provided a serious res remedy, which is called the new birth. Paul also calls it new creation. Peter calls it newborn babes. We must determine whether these phrases are merely religious metaphors, or could they illustrate a spiritual reality? You know, the image of spiritual birth also anticipates the hope of spiritual growth and maturity but are we forever trapped within the cancer of sin no grace not only wipes away sin grace teaches us how to avoid sin going forward so there's a cure not just a treatment so what's our challenge how do we see jesus then how do we see jesus for many of us he's only a treatment you know, we pop the Jesus pill and move along as if we're good to go. I've been there. And when we limit the work of Jesus to nothing but forgiveness, I think we lose sight of the countless possibilities of experiencing a new kind of life with him, here and now. And that's a shame because the cure really does work, friends. Not only in the next life, but right here, right now, in this one as well. Let me put... Some of these things into perspective with a modern parable once there were two high school students who each received scholarships to harvard university full rides every possible expense paid both were bright kids both felt intimidated by the reputation of such a prestigious college and they each thought i certainly don't deserve to be here one student studied day and night, and she gave it all she had. The other student began to enjoy the thrill of college life. Parties in Boston, the big city, Beantown right next door, you know. Freedom of being on his own for the very first time in his life. By the midterm, the first student was still working hard, earning B's and C's in her classes. The other was failing every class and was placed on academic probation. By Christmas, the first student had earned a 3.0 GPA and the second had flunked out of Harvard. Which of these two students laid hold of the opportunity given to them? You know, of course, we know the answer is the first student, humble, hardworking. The second student was the object of gossip. How could he throw away an opportunity like that, people asked. So imagine for a moment that the grace of God, I'm just really going to simplify it, is like a full ride to Harvard, right? Beyond expectation. Every single expense paid. A life-changing opportunity. You know, anyone watching these two students would conclude that 
the student who flunked out had thrown away a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Scholarship to Harvard was a gift of grace. But the truth was, once received, the work was just the beginning. God's grace is something like this parable. He does for us what we could not possibly do for ourselves. What is beyond our reach is joyfully paid in full by Jesus Christ. But his work is just the beginning. Why would we squander the possibilities of new birth in Jesus Christ? Like the student who received a full ride to Harvard and continued to work hard, we need to receive the grace of God for what it is, a calling to a new kind of life right now. Now, some people might object to the close association between the word grace and the word work. You might ask, God's grace comes with no strings attached, right? We should be clear about this. No amount of effort on our part could win his pardon, right? Amen? This is true enough, but it certainly isn't the whole story. Absolutely not. Our salvation story goes beyond the fact that God picked up the tab when we couldn't pay. Our new birth into the Christian life it, it is an invitation into the kingdom of God, and that reality spills over onto the earth and even into the next life. Amen? This is demonstrated for us in the life of the Apostle Paul. In the earliest days of his conversion to Christianity, he knew immediately that Jesus had grabbed a hold of him for a purpose. Paul was instantly filled with gratitude for God's grace and forgiveness, and he was also eager to get busy with God's work. He began to call himself God's fellow worker, as in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In his calling as an apostle, he continued the he considered the church in Corinth to be God's field. He considered himself to be privileged to join the workforce. Paul was well aware that he had no right, he had no merit, no moral standing to plant churches, to powerfully preach God's word, or humbly pastor God's new church in Corinth. I mean, after all, he had persecuted Christians for years before his conversion. But thank goodness he was also aware that his qualifications were not the issue. By the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect, Paul says. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Can you see what a strange combination of words Paul puts together there? He uses grace and worked harder all in one sentence. So what was true for Paul... I think is true for us too. When we are born into God's family, we're born into the family business as it were, right? God's grace doesn't just wipe away our sin. God's grace asks us to now join in the work of the kingdom. Dallas Willard had a saying that we should all take to heart. Grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. It's pretty humbling. This wonderful distinction reminds us of the proper response to God's saving work. The Apostle Paul understood this side of grace as well. This is the same Apostle who described his task of one of great endurance in troubles, hardships, distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, 2 Corinthians, all in order to share what he himself had been given. Paul had no trouble seeing the connection between grace and effort. Richard Foster helps us understand the ongoing work of grace. Here's what he says, grace saves us from life without God. Even more, he says, it empowers us for life with God. The grace we receive at new birth is just the introduction. As students of Jesus, we need grace for growth as well. Grace opens up the startling possibility that we do not have to vacillate between Wow. 
come Holy Spirit. <laughs> wow. Grace opens up the startling possibility that we don't have to vacillate between sin and forgiveness, sin and forgiveness, sin and forgiveness. Instead, grace shows us the destiny we have in Christ Jesus. What is the deeper side of grace? The deeper side of grace, I think, is the discovery that our new birth should be followed by steady and persevering growth, closer and closer to the image of Jesus. The deeper side of grace is that when we begin to join the family business, we also begin to take on the family likeness. Amen? Here's another way to think of it. Co-laboring with Christ is the very activity that begins to grow the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. As we joyfully work side by side with Jesus, we begin to become conformed more and more to his image. In Romans chapter 8 verse 29 tells us that this is our destiny, to be more and more like Jesus. Not only will we live with him forever, he wants us to be changed into his likeness now. In Matthew chapter 11, it points to an important revelation. Jesus invites anyone who would follow him to come under his instruction and learn his way of life. In Matthew 11, starting in verse 28, we read, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So Jesus is saying, take my yoke upon you, learn from me. This image was common enough in his day. A yoke who is a large, heavy collar, right? Which places the strength of an ox or a horse at the disposal of someone else. So grace calls us to take on the yoke of God's work. We place our strengths at his disposal. And he shares the burden with us. It's amazing. He will not conquer us or break us. However, we must bow before him as a matter of choice. This path to becoming like Jesus starts with his invitation. Come to me. After he speaks, we can choose to accept the invitation by only one method, and that's to humble ourselves. Grace is about more than knowing. It's about being. If God wants me to, to give me the grace to be more like Jesus, and if it takes a little effort on my part, brothers, sisters, count me in. That's how we take the yoke. That's how we position ourselves. To learn from him. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you that, and we're astounded that even looking at an aspect of you, a part of you, God, is still uh, unfathomable. It's still so deep and rich and endless, Lord. So we praise you and thank you for who you are, your holiness and your kindness, your mercy everything that you are, Lord, that would take a lifetime or more to list all your attributes. But as we focus on your grace, God, we pray that we would grab a hold of that yoke that you offer us. And Jesus promises that it's a light yoke, it's not heavy, and that you take it with us, God, which it's amazing. You have work for us to do and work with us to do. So Lord, I pray that we jump in as your church and as your people. I pray that we till the soil of our minds and our hearts, Lord, to be more receptive to the seeds that you're speaking to us and the hope you offer to us every day. I pray we would be more thankful and grateful, Lord, even in the midst of fear that you are continually blessing us and with us, Lord. Help us to open our eyes to see the work around us that you want us to work with you on, Lord. Help us to reach out to each other. Help us to reach out to you in the work that you have for us to do, Lord. And we know that that work 
that work has unbelievable benefits even into the next life. And we will never experience the joy and the wonder of working with you uh, in any other way, God, just by, we just need to humble ourselves and, and answer your call. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for all you're doing at Greenwoods, Lord. Thank you for the generosity that uh, you've instilled in each of us. And the church said, amen. We have the offering plates here if you brought your offering with you. Uh, we also continue to receive your, your offerings by mail. Post Office Box 346, Ashley Falls. And we have online giving as well and even a text to give number and um, you're all using it. So just bless you. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your commitment to God's kingdom work here. Thank you for continuing to walk with Greenwoods with all of us uh, during these interesting times, even through de technical difficulties. Um, Thank you for your generosity, and uh, every cent of it is prayed over, every cent of it is a blessing, and every cent of it is used. So um, we just thank you. Thank you for your generosity. Let's um, stand and offer our hearts to God in our uh, last couple of songs here.
Amen. Finally, brothers, sisters, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Aim for comfort. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with each and every one of you. God bless you. Thank you.